Welcome to the Gay Buddhist Forum, where teachers from all schools of Buddhism offer their perspectives on the Dharma and its application in modern times, especially for LGBTQI audiences. These talks are offered freely to the world and made possible by appreciative listeners. If you would like to support our efforts to share the Dharma with underserved audiences, please visit gaybuddhist.org. There you can donate, find a list of upcoming speakers, or enjoy many hundreds of these recorded talks dating back to 1996. Welcome back, everyone. Um, at this point, it's our tradition to just go around the room and introduce ourselves and then uh, say hello to the folks on Zoom as well. Um, if you're new or returning after a long absence, please let us know that as you say your name. So my name is Grisha. My name is Simona. It's the first time I came here. Uh, I'm 34 years old. I just moved back to San Francisco um, after the pandemic from Canada. And I work with CSF uh, in research. Welcome. Yes, welcome. 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 I'm Jason. Hey, my name is Haro. Um, I've uh, been here for four years ago when I moved, when I lived in San Francisco, but I also uh, just moved back. Um, but I used to come occasionally on, on Sundays, about six or seven years ago when I lived here, so I'm um, happy to be back. Welcome back. Thank Welcome. you. I'm Mike. I'm Jack. I've been coming here before. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm Blake. I'm Brad. My name is Greg. My name is Stephanie. My name is David. I do remember Jack. <laughs> My name is Cass. Welcome everyone in person. And then on Zoom we have uh, about 20 folks. Um, Francisco Gable, who we'll hear from today, Andres, Bob, Charles, Chris, Daniel, Don, Frisco, Gary, George, Henry, uh, I think another, I think that's another Charles, the iPad, and Jerry, Matthew, Michael, Another Michael, Richard, Ron, Samuel, uh, Tom, Tom, Tom. <laughs> Welcome everyone on Zoom and in the room. Um, so uh, I'll introduce our teacher for today, uh, Francisco Murillo Gable. Uh, Francisco has been devoted to Dharma since 2003. Thanks to this, he made an unexpected recovery from an accident that had rendered him disabled. He studies and teaches early Buddhism with the scholar monk, Bhikkhu Analeo. He is uh, in teacher training at the Insight Meditation Center with Andrea Fella and Gil Fransdahl. His primary interests are teaching underserved groups and bringing the Dharma to, this, uh, to the greater Spanish-speaking world. And um, all right, thank you, Francesco. Great. Thank you, Gracia. I was uh, asked uh, by your organizer to add a little bit more about me. Um, I don't have a big presence online, and that's by uh, intention, because I work a lot with uh, Venerable Analyu, as who's a monastic at the Barry Center for Buddhist Studies, and uh, so we kind of follow the Buddhist way, uh, the Buddhist path of uh, not really getting followers, not really gathering uh, a reputation, and so I kind of play it low um, because I'm affiliated with him. And teach with him, and uh, I teach with him at the Barry Center for Buddhist Studies. We teach a PATH program, a year-long program to for experienced practitioners. I also teach with him and myself throughout Latin America and Spain. That's uh, kind of the heart of my teaching, bringing the Dharma into the Spanish-speaking world. I work with uh, about a dozen different uh, sanghas throughout Latin America and a very large sangha in Spain. And uh, I'm also affiliated with the Inside Meditation Center. That's my home sangha right here in the Bay Area. Pleasure to be with you. Thank you for the invitation. I um, was asked to um, share openly about myself, uh, about the condition that brought me to this path. And then I'm also going to weave that in with uh, just a broad brush of what this path has look, looks like uh, from the early Buddhist point of view, which just means the early Theravadan view. By early Buddhism, we're talking about the Buddhism that evolved before 
there were three great uh, branches like we have now, the Theravadan, uh, the Mahayana, and the Vajrayana, which I think is well represented in this group. And so I'm going to talk about the path uh, very broadly and uh, talk about my experience within the path because uh, some people find that uh, supportive and uh, a little bit encouraging. Uh, I came to the path in a very bad way. Uh, I was uh, injured in an accident and uh, severely injured, and my spine uh, degenerated. It became like a person who was 95 years old overnight, and I had to have uh, major reconstruction of the spine, a bunch of surgeries, and at the end of it all, I wasn't walking uh, and in a lot of neurological pain that couldn't be controlled with pain medication. So I was in a pretty bad shape. Um, and that's how I found this path. And uh, I can tell you that today um, it's a very different life. I, I still have pain, uh, but I have evolved uh, to the point where it doesn't bother me. And I have uh, really found healing through this path uh, with, of course, good medical care, appropriate medical care. So uh, that's how I know this path. I know this path through severe pain and uh, both emotional and physical. And uh, I can tell you that uh, it's not with any irony that I, this path is, um, is truly a path of the happy ones. Uh, the early Buddhists were considered the happy ones because uh, what where this path leads to is uh, an unworldly happiness, a joy, a gladness, and a happiness that uh, is not really of this world, is of the world of the mind that moves through us and that we liberate through this practice. So it's about becoming yourself, uh, truly yourself, um, finding a reverence for yourself through despair, through discouragement, through suffering, through the toils that life hits us with, and uh, moving through to really another heart, uh, the heart that's here and just waiting to be released and experienced. And, um, and the way we do this is uh, through a direct experience. In the early Theravadan tradition, we do a, a lot of, place a lot of emphasis on two qualities that you probably have heard about, two practice, practice paths, two wings really, insight and tranquility, vipassana and samatha. And uh, I'm going to talk about how those two are interwoven in the practices of mindfulness, uh, mindfulness of breathing specifically. Maybe some of you have heard of this, uh, this course called the Anapanasati Sutta. And I'm going to talk about the path today through that discourse because uh, that discourse was considered the uh, sublime practice by the Buddha himself. It was the practice that the Buddha himself would do ongoingly. And it contains the entire trajectory of this beautiful path all the way from the wretches of Dukkha and uh, all the way to finding oneself through Dukkha into... Um, through knowing the arising and the passing of things very profoundly and directly, and then coming to an emptiness. But not an emptiness that's nothing. Uh, when we are talking about emptiness, we're talking about emptying really the kind of the self, the self that doesn't work, <laughs> the self that doesn't work, the self that leads to dukkha. Dukkha is this word that we loosely translate as dissatisfaction, as pain and suffering. It most closely means pain in Pali, the language of the Buddha. So the first thing that I had to discover for myself was uh, a connection to my body. When I was uh, in pain, homebound for three years, I had to retire from my very enjoyable job in the tech industry and became homebound. Uh, overnight after the surgeries and um, with a lot of disconnection and dissociation from my own body uh, that was uh, that took hold pretty deeply because of the series of major trauma traumatic events that happened with the accident and then the surgeries and then the pain that wouldn't go away and uh, 
Pain is uh, an amazing teacher. Uh, it's not the teacher that we choose, um, but it shows up in life in different ways. For for most of us, I would say, I think many of us experience dukkha in one form or another, dissatisfaction. And um, I was disconnected from my body, so this practice was very helpful because uh, this practice starts with the body. It starts with uh, looking at the mind and uh, understanding that our mind has obstacles in it and uh, learning to see through those obstacles and learning to put them aside in our meditative life. When we sit for meditation, we sit for some time, like we just did now, to be in seclusion, to be in seclusion from the world, just put all our, our preoccupations, our plans, our agendas aside for a few moments to kind of go in here, go in here and explore this amazing realm that constitutes this, this living experience. And um, we do that first in the body. And uh, we place a lot of emphasis in the body, in the tradition, as you probably know very well. Uh, sometimes uh, mindfulness can be called bodyfulness, um, because we really get to know this body in its materiality, in its time. Uh, we know that this body is, has a limited time, and we connect with that. Uh, not for any morbid reasons, but we contemplate this body's... Um, ending and seizing to really take advantage of now because we have this gift of awareness of consciousness of being here and knowing that we're here and uh the practice invites us to really come here just come here come here there is this light this spark that goes away when this body uh dies um whatever your interpretation of uh, the afterlife may be we do for us as far as we know this light is limited we'll have an ending point a very clear one and we look at that to relish the spark that comes and it's in the body and so we go into the body to get to know really get to know our mind and get to know our life and get to know what goes on because the body is full of a life and processes that if we go into contemplation with the body into its material form into its uh, elemental form uh, as uh, different parts uh, different dimensions of elements and um, breathing through the breathing we discover an inner world there is this inner there's an inner world here that generally the the self doesn't connect to profoundly like we can in meditation and i'll tell you it's really really makes a difference to connect to this body because uh you see the pain uh that catches our awareness so tightly sometimes uh, that we appropriate ourselves with is only one piece of what exists in the mind and it's very real of course the back pain hurts the knee pain hurts and uh not undermining that believe me i know pain um intimately uh but it's about a different intimacy it's about an intimacy with this organism as a vast field of of form living form changing form breathing form that has nothing to do with the self and so that's why it's a liberating thing it has nothing to do with me the identity francisco gable this body has its own 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 realm uh, that i don't really control very much uh, very little, in fact, compared to how it controls itself, how it heals itself. So we put our pain, when we put our pain through, yeah, and it's difficult to connect to pain, I, I know, uh, but we find ways through the wholesome condition of feeling what is comfortable in this body, um, 
what is good in this mind right now, just being here and present in my meditation and letting those conditions, giving ourselves over to those conditions, uh, really sensing into those conditions, really sensing this whole body changes uh, pain because it, it gives it something to work with, something other than itself. And what we do is we learn to take away um, the layers of kind of affliction and poor me. Believe me, I had a lot of poor me uh, when I came to the practice. I did not, uh, for good reasons, I had a very happy job and um, suddenly my and life and a very active life and suddenly it was over. Uh, I was just home, home, and uh, it was not what I wanted uh, in any way. And I fought it. I fought it. I came to this practice practice to fix that and to go back into the game. Uh, Now I am dedicated to this path after 18 years. So the body is, uh, is the first dimension of the purification. And purification just is not a not a religious word, not meant to be good or bad. Uh, purification just means kind of clearing away, clearing away the, the crust, crustiness that it builds around um, this awareness, this experience of ours in our lives. And we can miss our lives sometimes. Uh, we can miss what moves through us, the unique things that move through us. We can really miss ourselves sometimes, so caught up in the, the dukkha of life. Uh, what doesn't fit, what doesn't work, that's what I mean by dukkha. I use that word because uh, there really is no English word to translate dukkha, that we translate generally as suffering and pain. And so the, the body, and then as we get into the body, we get to see the mind better. Uh, we learn to see our thoughts we learn to see the thoughts uh, as uh, elemental pieces in their form in the body and uh, how they just keep changing, how they keep flowing. We allow them to flow by recognizing them in the body through the six sense gates, the five senses that you know very well, and the uh, sixth sense, the mind. And uh, we connect we have a direct experience when we think and we learn to do this because um, in meditation we 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 create um, wholesome conditions by relaxing the body there's a joy that starts in the body there's a joy that becomes more palpable more accessible and it takes time all of this is a cultivation but there are degrees of this right now in your meditation you hopefully experience uh, some letting go, some relaxation, some ease, uh, even just a little bit, even just a little bit goes a long way because it builds, it builds. Right now, right here, uh, there's this subtle, pleasant tone in your experience. Right here, right now. Maybe you can close your eyes if you wish, uh, if it's comfortable, to notice that the body breathing itself without our doing anything about the body or the body hearing sounds all by itself, the whole posture of the body knowing the space that it occupies on the very tip of your, the crown of your skull, down all the way to the toes. In between there's all this space that's full. It's empty. You can feel that the boundaries are fluid. There's not really like a how hard boundary, but there is hardness. And the seat, the bones, and this body is just going on with this vitality flowing all the way through, all the way through the body. And it has a pleasant tone. 
we can call that happiness, a form of happiness that's always here and available. And we, of course, get to this further and further, the more we cultivate uh, awareness of the body, connecting with the body, calming the body. And then the same point of reference we can use to keep looking inside and receiving thoughts and then receiving them, seeing what we are conscious of and then receiving them and seeing how they manifest in the body. And maybe they just can keep sometimes depending on how they are, they keep moving. If we keep allowing and registering, come back here, come back here. Let's be here together. My body, my thoughts, and remembering the happiness. It's good to remember the happiness. It's a cultivation of wisdom to come back into here the pleasant tone. And we can note that some thoughts are unpleasant or pleasant and just noticing them that way sometimes just allows them to keep going. And if we do this in a continuous cultivation, our thoughts do keep transforming and many different kinds of thoughts. There are some thoughts that we can't really see that we just know that there's hmm, something unpleasant. And then we surrender, or give it in, sense, receive this whole body. And what happens is, uh, is just a wonderful thing. We, we settle. There's a settling, a settling of experience, settling of uh, the sometimes agonizing things that uh, we have to manage in life or the attachments to the joys that we want, that we don't have, all of that stuff, uh, we can settle and become fully connected within this mind-body. And uh, then we experience layers of concentration. That's also what's in the path. And then it gets really good, because if we experience the settling of thoughts into this mind, what we find is that there's a mind that's actually not what I think it is at all. There is this knowing instrument that's me, that's to use kind of a lore in our Theravadan tradition. It's vast like the sky. And we experience that directly through going inside, like we do when, when we sit in meditation, like maybe we did now. And this mind is actually happy. It's a gladdened mind, all within its source. It's a, it has a gladdening thing that just surges and emerges. And we allow this, we can allow more and more of this uh, to suffuse us, is how the tradition talks about it. Like to be drenched in this gladdening potential of the mind that is calm and relaxed. And so that encourages us to keep going. Uh, it encouraged me, it sure the heck encouraged me to keep going through the pain that I had to go to, to begin to walk. After three years, I started to begin to walk. I uh, started to find ways to walk. I remember walking in the Castro. I lived in the Castro at the time with my partner. I've been married to the same guy for about 25 years. I remember walking with a cane. I remember my friends who didn't want to hang out walk with me anymore when I started to walk with a cane. I remember that very well. I lost a lot of my friends uh, at that time. But my true friends also emerged. But it was a lot of losses. It was a very, very, very difficult time uh, to suddenly be disabled as a relatively young person. And uh, I remember the pain of walking with a cane. 
uh, in the streets of the Castro and uh, the fear of getting on a bus because I couldn't drive. That fear of getting on a bus because uh, it felt like I was surrounded by by just beasts because um, I was in so much pain. I, my body hurt so badly. and um, But I would learn to rest more over years of practice, dedicated practice, into the mind, this incredible instrument. And in our tradition, Theravadan tradition, and in many traditions of Buddhism, the mind is also equivalent to the heart. We're talking about a heart-body-mind uh, notion. It's not something that's up here by any means. Everything feels like it's up here because of the concentration of thinking tightens our brain up. And so we think that it all happens here. And neuroscience is a little, has different paradigms um, around this. And, but the body-mind is embodied and there it is limitless and we can rest in that and it nourishes us and it liberates us um, and we learn to have reverence for the, for this for this experience for this whole experience we learn to how it what it is to love oneself just love oneself fully simply just to love oneself without any thoughts resting here just breathing and so the path goes on it gets better we let go we let go further and further of all of the things we came into this world with for goodness sake what the inherited legacies of uh, of patterns of being, of ways we were trained, expected, and really corralled into being by the world, the world's conditioning, the world's time, the world's story. And um, we can let go of that, not permanently. I like having my identification card, um, and I like having my bank account. Uh, those things are important. Uh, but there's also a Dharma world, so to speak. And it's not some other world that exists out there. It's a direct experience through this body-mind, really knowing itself, processing itself, having reverence for itself. And we come always, although we've been doing it all along, we come to the arising and the passing away, just directly looking at arising and passing away. And it's a, it's really a marvelous thing, because when we're doing that, we can let go of greed, hatred, and delusion. Those are the three big bad, three big bad ones in our tradition. And I sure had to let go of a hatred that I had that I didn't know I had for the pain that I had of uh, ra rational. I didn't want the pain and I was really trying hard to let go of this terrible neuropathic pain that would not be alleviated by any amount of morphine that they gave me. And I was on buckets of morphine all those years after the back reconstructions and uh, all the stuff that they had to do to my spine so that I could survive. And uh, knowing that pain, knowing that pain, I still have a hard time saying love the pain because I don't know about loving pain like that, but maybe I even love the pain, but with a lot of respect, I want you to know that I really respect pain <laughs> and I really don't like people who tell me, well, didn't you get a lot from this experience because boy, they don't really know how, how painful, physically painful pain like that can be. But that pain transformed through knowing hatred, through knowing that how strongly I disliked it, and through learning that to be known and understood deeply, uh, connected to deeply, 
cared for deeply as mindfulness allows us to care for things without interfering anything, just letting things be, which is not easy, but it is good and it is very helpful because when we let things be, things have a way of continuing their flow through this organism and and we become ourselves as we become a flow of sorts as we become to be assume this nature that is a little bit kind of liquid like uh, when we are really immersed in the arising and the passing and the dispassion that comes from that the loosening of our fixations of how things really should be ought to be how I possess things all of that stuff loosening up not that we give up things that are important but loosening up the grip of craving and the grip of clinging and this word clinging um, I'm only saying it now after hopefully creating some nice conditions to bring it forth because for about nine years I didn't hear that word and my teacher Gil Franzo uses that word all the time but I just didn't want to I would not hear that word I hated that word that's how much I was clinging to an idea of myself the idea of the person who was going to go back and work and do all of that uh, stuff that was great I was having a lot of fun and uh, doing good in the world also and in a really happy relationship um, with my guy here but uh, the clinging clinging is something that let go over time and uh, it's been wonderful to discover another realm of being here that's very simple and basic where just breathing is enough only breathing here now resting in noble wholesome qualities like joy that's not of this world happiness that's not of this world concentration or samadhi a free mind it makes for a pretty good existence as I'm sure you all are familiar with who have come to Buddhism for that it's what we have to offer in Buddhism a joy that's in this world and not of this world that can move through us and we know ourselves you're very good just as you are all of you it's great nothing wrong with you nothing wrong with each one of us and we can know more about how to connect with ourselves through this wonderful path path I love this path I trust this path I've had to trust it the hard way and it's changed me and for the better I think and I want to share it with everyone because it's really good to be free and it's possible right here right now in this lifetime absolute freedom is possible so may you have a great path it's very much my pleasure to share this moment on your path our path together and uh, enjoy this beautiful day I think it became a little cloudy but I love clouds I'm gonna go for a big hike now because I, I love clouds may your practice nourish and bring you all the release and peace in the world for you thank you very much thank you Francisco I'm gonna open it up for questions and comments Cass, use your 10-inch voice. 10-foot voice, I mean. <laughs> okay. Thank you for sharing your um, your journey into uh, using Buddhism to um, 
to deal with this pain. I'm curious if you had to, if you had a practice before this crisis, this accident, and or did you come to Buddhism um, through a, a following the accident, and did you try other approaches? Um, and what kind of what led you to settle on um, using the a Buddhist practice as your way to um, deal with the this crisis in your life? Let me see. Uh, thank you for the question. I I had tried. I have tried many different practices along the way, alongside um, the what followed after the accident. Prior to the accident, I was um, well. I'll tell you this. This group, I will share this um, kind of private tidbit. Um, I was part of kind of a a group of gay guys in Los Angeles who would go down to Peru f to do sacred ceremonies and um, did ayahuasca with this group of guys. And uh, I was doing that in my early 20s. And uh, that was my spiritual path for a long time. Uh, that was uh, that did not yield what I needed uh, once I had the accident. So that all ended. That was one of the many things that ended. Uh, I was also raised Catholic, and uh, that didn't go well once uh, the church kicked me out. Uh, but now I've gone back, and uh, I feel the, the goodness of it. Uh, I really love the goodness of Catholicism and all the religions and all the Buddhist strands as well. Uh, quite ecumenical that way. Uh, happens when liberation hits and uh yeah i tried a lot of things i tried um healing yoga um all kinds of special yogas uh, and uh many modalities of healing um you wouldn't believe uh the amount of <laughs> things i tried out while i was trying this path and this is the only one that seemed to offer me a complete trajectory a very boundless dimension uh, for uh, liberation, full liberation. I'll have to just also own up because I want to be supportive for people in pain. Uh, if I, I also had a lot of therapy with a, an extraordinary therapist who was a faculty member at the Somatic Experiencing School. Um, she passed away, Maggie Phillips. I worked with her for 12 years, releasing the trauma from um, all the layers of trauma that I had accumulated. If I hadn't done that, I don't think the practice would have really sunk in to my body because my body was so dissociated from itself. I uh, just wanted to fully disclose that to be of help and support if anybody is caught that way. But no, it's been this practice and... Um, I think it's like I said, it's it's really a direct path because I touch it, I feel it, I experience it, I sense it directly. Uh, it's not con conceptual. Concepts are used, but they're let go of. It's different from other traditions of Buddhism. Concepts are used, but they're let go of in the experience, embodied experience. Thank you for that great question. Uh, yes. Um, I just want to thank you. Um, your story is remarkable. Your message is remarkable. But I must confess it was kind of eerie listening to it because it felt as if it had been sitting on the shoulder of my mind for the past few weeks and knew exactly what I needed to hear. Let me just say thank you one more time. Hmm. You're welcome, Bob. Thank you, Bob. Again, thank you. Remarkable. And we have Jason in the room. I usually hesitate to share. Um, everybody here knows that. Um, but I felt like I manifested the subject matter of today's army talk. I really want to express my gratitude. I was um, lying there for a second, I had to lie down. 
and um, that's how I um, practice at times, and that's perfectly fine, and it works very well for me. But I basically give you like a psychic heart hug um, to hear your story and how much I relate to it. I basically want to say like, I concur during your um, talk. I was paralyzed from the waist down. That's on October uh, 26th, um, 2020. And I was hospitalized for four months. It got out. Uh, COVID was like full force and um, locked away. I couldn't have any visitors, long story, come out. My theater company and life was vandalized and gone. And I was evicted illegally, um, doubly illegal because I was disabled and it was during a pandemic, etc. All my grief, it's hard to deal with. And then I related to the carrying the cane, like expression there. Um, and it wasn't funny at all being in like queer young clubs and having my cane actually kicked and stuff and being um, um, disrespected and um, then having them respond to, that, to my response to their disrespect, like I was responding poorly to their disrespect or whatever. So also I've had spontaneous like paralysis since then, once was four days, uh, once was one day and I think I learned to cope better, like sitting down, like, you know, uh, stress and, you know, oh my God, fire and brimstone is not going to help in this situation. I just need to get home safely. Um, and um, there have been occasional situations where, I, like, I ask for help and they're like, well, you can walk home. Like that very, like, um, should I forgive you for that statement? Sure, I will. I'll try. But my faith say I'm a very hybrid faith, I guess. Buddhism, um, I was baptized Roman Catholic. Um, Practice Judaism. I was raised Jewish by Jewish badass lesbians, and um, so the, a rabbi came to me because the chaplain came, and I was like uh, kind of adverse. I was like, I'm Jewish, so they sent the rabbi. They then came and gave. It was around. It was Hanukkah, so I was like, let me observe, say my prayers. Uh, uh, couldn't have candles in the uh, in the hospital, um, you know, because it's like oxygen. Like free roaming or whatever, <laughs> which is, sounds awful, you know, but it's that's true. But so there's sticker candles on them. So I practiced my faith, and my drag daughter in Los Angeles did like we did a witchy, witchy ceremony. She lit a candle, and we both um, I made a wish on the uh, the conjunction of Jupiter and Saturn. It was like a super whatever conjunction it happens every 26 years, and it was like the Christmas star. So, and four days later, I was walking. So. Basically, the other two times I've been paralyzed, it was like horrifying, but it's like, you know, and they still don't know what causes it. And I've got every, you know, MRI, etc. But that helped me with the Buddhism um, practice, because whenever I'm in the tube, I presume I'm going to be there for like half an hour, but it was actually two and a half. I was like, oh, that went by, you know, because I'm like, um, I can use this time to like heal and meditate, you know, it's like, um, you know, actually with the neck brace, like hold still, kind of thing, breathe. And um, so I tried to use it that way. So I knew I had to come today and bring, I had to deliver cookies and um, dress baked and to be with my uh, fellowship, my people who, um, they, um, I was on a lot of opioids, but I still came um, to the Sangha over Zoom and stuff. And so I'm grateful for all of that and all of your kindness and everything, because it's love. And um, I appreciate you, sir, about doing, um, you know, reaching out to bilingual, you know, audiences, you know, so I thank you for that as well. And uh, you're beautiful. And I'm sad you're taking We have Tom Bruin also, hand up. Can I say something to the gentleman who spoke, please? Yes, please. I just want to say thank you. And uh, I'm a fellow walker of uh, that tough path, the toughest path. And uh, yeah, I wish you well, man. I really wish you my best. Keep going. Do not give up. Keep going. It's possible to keep getting better no matter what. No matter what. Thank you. Tom? Mm -hmm. Francisco, thank you so much, um, you know, for transmitting these insights to us all, because uh, it really does feel like a transmission rather than just a teaching. 
Um, you know, you, you spoke about greed, hatred, and delusion. And in studying and hearing the Dharma, sometimes delusion is part of it is framed as, um, you know, identifying with the impermanent or, um, you know, conditioned phenomena. And sometimes I find myself retreating from the body, retreating into like these pleasant mind states of meditation, like escaping into that. But you talked about, um, you know, identifying with your body and getting to know it better. So how does one walk that path of not um, identifying with conditioned phenomena, but then becoming very familiar with and having a relationship with it? Thank you for the question, Tom. I love talking about this. Uh, this gets right to the meat of the matter. Uh, I hope that, that this word doesn't offend anybody. Uh, it's what I placed it in the teachings of the Anapanasati, the mindfulness of breathing, because there it's uh, about insight and tranquility. Uh, the mind states of deep tranquility and calming and samadhi and those delicious, wonderful, relaxed states that we love uh, are used conjointly in this practice of mindfulness of breathing to go we between them and then going back into seeing the arising and the passing. So the calming is used in the service of watching the arising and the passing of all the pieces of our experience so we return back which is why i ended with watching arising and passing dispassion cessation and letting go those are the four classical insight themes so we we develop as deep concentration as we can and of course like we say not get attached to it <laughs> and so let it go uh, but be f nourished by it in order to see what's happening in this body, in order to see what else arises. Something's always arising at the various levels of refinement and collectedness. So that's uh, basically how I think I see not becoming deluded in the practice of tranquility. Does that help, Tom? It does. It does. Um... So in closing, can you tell us how one might connect more with your teachings? I know you said you don't have a large online presence. You sort of shun that. Um, yeah, how could we learn more about this path that you're talking about and describing? Well, I'll point you to one of my main two teachers, who's Gil Fransdahl. He has teachings every single day uh, and uh, lots of stuff in the Insight Meditation Center website. And um, I will be teaching retreats at Spirit Rock in the coming years. Uh, so you can watch out for my name there or at the Insight Meditation Society. I will also teach. I'm teaching a retreat in Spanish at the Insight Retreat Center here in Redwood City. Uh, I save my energies a lot for the Spanish-speaking world because we have so many Dharma teachers who teach in English and so few and Spanish is the third or fourth or fifth most spoken language in the world and there's just this little itty bit of Dharma teaching there things don't get translated and they don't learn English that's uh, why I give myself over to the Spanish speaking world abroad but I'll, I will be teaching um, will be teaching uh, in the future uh, with certain teachers who are familiar to you at Spirit Rock um, so you, but in the meantime, Gil Franz though will carry will carry this path all the way through for you, over and over again. Thank you so much for the question, Tom. Is that our time, Gracie, or is there another question? We have maybe time for another quick question, or do you wish to close, Gracia? You tell me. Yeah, we should probably wrap up soon, unless there's any burning desire questions. We did no one more hands up in the room. Um, so yeah, let's, um, we pause here for announcements. Um, do you want to hear from our host today? Hi, I'm Cass. Um, it turns out I'm your host today. Um, so please stay and enjoy the fellowship of the Sangha. Uh, we have hot water for tea. 
Um, if you have some tea, leave your cup in the sink at the um, end and um, take care of it. Um, uh, Tony and um, Jason are, have provided uh, cookies, um, sweet treats. Um, so thank you for that, um, Tony um, and Jason. Um, I'll be coming around with the uh, Dawn Ball. Uh, whatever you're moved to uh, donate will help us pay for the rent of this um, facility. Um, pay for uh, it'll allow us to offer Donna to our speakers. Um, it pays for the newsletter, um, which goes largely to people who are incarcerated. Um, and uh, hopefully, we'll get back to providing. Uh, monthly meals to the uh, large people at the Larkin Street Youth Center. Um, there's a sign-up sheet for people who um, might want to be added to our uh, directory. Um, and I think that's all. We'll be uh, at the on the at the end of the month. We'll have a, a newsletter going out, so I encourage people to come. Um, I think it's the 29th, is that right? Mm -hmm. um, to help um, get those insiders into the mail. Thank you, Cass. Uh, any other announcements? Uh, let me just say next week's speaker is Frank Ostaseski. He's an internationally respected Buddhist teacher, visionary, co founder of the Zen Hospice Project. And the, co and the founder of the Meta Institute. He has lectured at Harvard Medical School and the Mayo Clinic, leading corporations like Google and Apple, and teaches at major spiritual centers around the globe. His groundbreaking work has been featured on Bill Moyer's PBS series, On Our Own Terms, highlighted on the Oprah Winfrey Show, and honored by the Dalai Lama. Well, he is author of The Five Invitations, Discovering What Death Can Teach Us About Living Fully which is a great book I can attest to. Um, so that's next week. And, okay, Francisco, do you have a dedication of merit, or would you like us to use ours? I'm happy to offer that. Okay. Well, give us a second in the room to circle up, and then... Uh... All right, Francisco. I'd like to invite you to close your eyes if that's comfortable, or leave them open if you prefer. And breathing together, feeling the entire body in its beautiful aliveness here. Maybe relishing in the beauty of the word here so much goodness is present right now in this moment gathered from your wonderful attention to yourselves to the teachings accumulating merit for yourselves and for others may the merit of our time together bear fruit for ourselves and our lives. May they be of use to this world. May all beings be happy. May all beings be at ease. May all beings have peace. Thank you. Thank you, Francisco. Thanks, Francisco. Thanks. Amigos. Thank you for listening to the Gay Buddhist Forum. If you would like to hear several new talks per month and be notified of upcoming speakers so you can participate live, please subscribe to this podcast, like us on Facebook, and join our mailing list by visiting gaybuddhist.org.